and I turn to my neighbor, what would you, what would you say? How would you send your messages? I know that you have slides. Yes. And I thank you for that. <laughs> Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Jean-Claude, thanks for the introduction. Uh, Thierry de Montréal for setting this up. It's always a pleasure to be here, an event that I'm looking forward the whole year. My privilege and uh, honor this morning is to start this session off, uh, and I'll do so with a number of slides. Uh, first of all, the state of the world economy, summarized uh, with a very Eurocentric view here, uh, four economies, uh, the Eurozone, the United States, the UK, and China. And what we see here is a state of fragility. Now we see that those bars uh, go up and go down. Uh, the Eurozone's not growing. Uh, these are quarter on quarter growth rates. The third quarter is just in flash estimates, so quite fresh. The Eurozone is at the brink of a recession. The United States are surprising us with relatively high growth rates, quarter on quarter in the third quarter 2023. The annualized growth rate would be almost 5%. Uh, this is a lot. Uh, I'm not sure what uh, you say, uh, Jean-Claude, but uh, uh, in, those, in those times where we need to cool down our economies to get rid of inflation, this looks uh, red hot, uh, too much and unsustainable. And China, the engine of growth for so many years, is uh, not growing steadily. It's up and down. And uh, one of the, the major impressions that this slide gives to me is how similar the Chinese and the American experience look like if you look at those, at those bars. And the United Kingdom here. Uh, looking very much like uh, the Eurozone. The world is such growing with a rate at, of about 3% uh, in this year, next year, a little bit more, but certainly below the uh, levels that uh, we have seen over the last years. Now, that is not surprising given the shocks that we have been under. Uh, and I would say what we should take away from that is not only divergences across uh, the Atlantic and across China and, uh, and Europe, but a relative uh, lack of uh, collapse, no? because resilience is uh, what we should see here. Even for the Eurozone, uh, the feared recession, if it comes, will be a mild one, and uh, uh, we're not uh, facing a big, big disaster here. The next year, some improvement in the Eurozone yeah. in our estimates, some improvement in the United That's Kingdom, uh, <laughs> decline in the United States, uh, and the shift sideways in China. The big issue for us economists over the last uh, two years or so, of course, has been inflation. The good news is that uh, headline inflation is coming down. Uh, on, the, uh, on the right hand side, you see the, the United States, on the left hand side, the Eurozone. In both, it's coming down. Core inflation is very much the same now in those two areas, uh, surprisingly, something like 4.2, 4.1%. But what you also see is that um, uh, the Eurozone has uh, a larger. Uh, trajectory to run through. We have been at higher rates than the, than the Eurozone. And what uh, worries me, me here is uh, that um, the 2% target is still quite uh, uh, far away from us. Uh, if you look at the green, the green bars in this, uh, in this picture, this is services inflation, uh, and you see it's very high, both still in uh, the United States and also in the Eurozone. And the services inflation, of course, reflects wage growth most uh, more than all, all the other categories. And so I think we, we must say the job's not yet done. Uh, the central bankers are gaining back control. That is true. But um, uh, I fear that uh, uh, we're really in a situation uh, higher for longer, uh, as, the, as the professionals say. And uh, the fight against inflation will define the world economy for more than the next one or two years. My fear is that um, uh, the strong increase in interest rates uh, uh, will feed into financial risks, and we have not seen everything yet. So on top of all the geoeconomic uh, struggles that we're facing, the climate disaster, financial risks, I think, are high. Uh, the rates will be longer for, higher for longer, I've said so. But we know that monetary policy comes with a lag, and uh, that lag can be substantial. Um, and uh, my view is that uh, were a, a large share of what monetary policy will achieve has not yet, is not yet visible in the data. Uh, we see that fiscal policy needs to, be, needs to become sustainable again. That's true in the Eurozone, but it's very much true in the United States. Um, uh, and that too will put pressure 
on the on growth and on the on the, the financial markets. Quantitative tightening has not really fully started, uh, and that uh, uh, will also uh, uh, affect uh, interest rates, the long-run interest rates and the growth perspectives. Only 20%, according to some uh, um, estimates, of the total impact of monetary policy tightening is yet in the data, so more to come. Uh, and um, uh, what I fear is that um, the financial crisis that we have seen you know, uh, showing its face um, uh, earlier this year is not yet over. Somewhere all those fixed income uh, assets must be that have uh, come under pressure over the, over the last uh, years with the high interest rates. And we, we only need a big shock, you know, that forces uh, insurances, for example, to liquidate their holdings uh, to see more financial stress in the system. Uh, so I'm a bit fearful on this side. And I'm also a little bit fearful about the Eurozone Inflation differential, differentials across the zone are huge uh, uh, in the October uh, inflation rates. The difference between Slovakia and Belgium is something like 950 basis points. That's enormous uh, and uh, something that worries me quite a bit. Uh, we are far away from, a, from a, an optimal monetary area in Europe. This should not be possible uh, if we were really having an integrated single market. And the interest rates spread uh, across the Eurozone is up. Um, uh, look at Italy with almost 150% of debt over GDP and the, and the interest payments more than <laughs> doubling. Uh, that puts stress on the system. Now, if I, if I may look at the international arena, what we see is that uh, the boom uh, in use of economic sanctions is going on. This is the, it's a translation, if you like, in, in economics, what we see in the political world. Um, War by other means, as the political science colleagues say, political conflict that's fought out with economic means. The trend's not good, so this is data from the Global Sanction Database that I'm putting together with U.S. colleagues, that uh, exponential growth. Um, that is certainly something that's weighing on, uh, on the growth perspectives of the world economy and shows that the political risks are, of course, translating into economic risks because sanctions mean uh, disruption of global value chains mean uh, decoupling, at least at the bilateral level. And so that's what we see here in terms of globalization. That's my preferred measure of globalization, is just taking a quantity index of international goods traded divided by quantity <laughs> index of industrial production. So we're hopefully comparing here apples with apples and uh, not bananas. Uh, and what we see here is Resilience on the one hand, no? so the world has not deglobalized, but, it, but the hyperglobalization here in blue has stopped, and it had stopped like 15 years ago. But what we do see is at the, at the, in, the, in, the in the newest data that uh, the world economy is slowing down, a significant decline in this measure. So trades falling faster than industrial production. The World uh, Trade Organization's trade reports are relatively alarmist. No? The last, latest version of it. Um, and I think what we can say is that the decoupling that's happening, for example, at the bilateral level between the United States and China, is also eating into the aggregate data. Trade diversion uh, can only go some way to mitigate the bilateral effects uh, of uh, less trade, for example, across uh, the Pacific. And then uh, something I would like to bring our attention to is uh, uh, the enlargement of the BRICS group. Uh, the uh, to six more members. I think this uh, is significant. Uh, it's under discussed, as far as I can say. There are implications on the world financial system, as the BRICS have their own bank, for example, and setting up uh, uh, more autonomous currency systems. Uh, and the enlargement, of course, involves uh, this country here, the United Arab Emirates. And so I thought it's important to bring it up. In terms of numbers, share of the BRICS plus six uh, in global GDP, or in global population, this enlargement is not making a big change, but what it does is it brings in countries that have been outside of, uh, uh, of the inner circle of, uh, of policy making, like Iran, for example, uh, into, the, into the BRICS. And I believe that is a challenge uh, for the world order as we've seen it. Uh, the hope is that this does not lead to more polariza polarization, but certainly uh, it should, uh, uh, th this event tells us something about the situation that we are in in the world economy, and we should uh, take note of this. Here I'll stop, Jean Claude. Thank thanks you for having me again. Thank you very much, Gabriel. You you stick to the concept, <laughs> which is give messages, short, concise messages. Thank you very much indeed.
uh, on, on the inflation, I will only say I share entirely the other views. Uh, that being said, I was struck myself that core inflation on both sides of the Atlantic is now exactly the same figure, yeah. which says something and give credibility to the fact that they have the same goal. They have the same definition of price stability, which is reassuring, all taken into account, even if, uh, as you said very wisely, the challenges are still there, of course. So thank you very much.